Hello and welcome to the States of Change Learning Festival. My name is Brenton Caffin and I'm the Executive Director of States of Change. Uh, we're delighted that so many of you could join us from around the world for our festival opening and uh, feel free to let us know where you're joining us from in the chat. Uh, I'm joining you today from the traditional lands of the Paramang people of the Adelaide Hills. I'd like to acknowledge the, tradi the traditional owners of this land and all of the lands we're joining this session from and recognize all elders past, present and emerging. It's National Reconciliation Week here in Australia. and We recognize that we all have a role to play when it comes to reconciliation. In playing our part, we collectively build relationships and communities that value us Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, histories, cultures, and futures. And as our guest speaker, Tyson Yunker Porter, writes in his excellent book, Sand Talk, it starts with respect. In moments like this, it can, be, it can be very tempting to get locked into the present and the here and now. But part of this festival is looking to what comes next. And to do that, we also need to know and respect what has come before. States of Change is in many ways a very new learning community. We're still developing and refining our ways of sharing our knowledge, our stories and frameworks. But some people have been sharing their knowledge continuously for tens of thousands of years. What can we learn from the world's oldest living culture about how to live sustainably and harmoniously with people and planet? And as we embark on our festival of learning for the next three weeks, how might we better understand and adopt indigenous knowledge principles in the way that we capture and share our own learning and practice. To explore these questions, we're delighted to have with us today Tyson Young Porter as our festival opening speaker. Tyson is the award-winning author of Sand Talk and is an academic, an arts critic, and a researcher who belongs to the Appalach, belongs to the Appalach clan in far North Queensland. He casts traditional tools and weapons and also works as a senior lecturer in indigenous knowledges at Deakin University in Melbourne. Tyson will speak for around 30 to 40 minutes. We will be then be joined in conversation by Angie Tangairi from the Southern Initiative in Auckland. As this is such a large audience, uh, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function to submit your question. And there is an upvoting function if you'd like to support a question that's already been raised. And we'll try to incorporate as many of these as time permits. Uh, feel free also to uh, um, tweet uh, uh, things that you find interesting in this conversation, the hashtag is hashtag SOCFEST, S-O-C-F-E-S-T. The session is being closed captions, closed captioned, so you can turn the function on and off yourself uh, in Zoom. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Tyson uh, to tell us how Indigenous thinking can help us save the world. Over to you, Tyson. Um, ah, sorry, I, I was waiting for you guys to put the video on. No, the host <laughs> has stopped it. That's up for you, Flag, and I have to put that uh, video on uh, now. Yes, please, put your video on. There we go. There we Beautiful. go. All I'll right. turn mine off. Hey, he's going. <laughs> Thanks so much for inviting me. That's a huge honor. Um, great that we can still do that from uh, our living rooms. Look, uh, you know, we're all living in, in a, a time of massive change right now. And I'm not talking about this little uh, blip that's seeing us, you know, cooped up in our houses for a while. You know, I'm talking about this um, massive period of geological upheaval, the Anthropocene or whatever you want to call it. I don't, I think that's unfairly named because I don't think it's humans that are doing it. They shouldn't call it the Anthropocene. Um, because it's, you know, <laughs> you know, 90% of this waste um, is not being done by our communities. It's being done by industry. You know, 90% of the energy that's being used, 90% of the water that's being used, you know, so us having some shorter showers and, you know, saving on some of the food that we throw out. When there's corporations burning mountains of food to stimulate, um, you know, demand, so that uh, they can limit supply, um, you know, by, by limiting supply so that they can jack the prices up. All these monopolies, all these things going on. Um, it's not us, it's not human beings as some kind of flawed beast just rampaging across the surface of the earth, you know, destroying it. Oh, inevitably, it's our nature to destroy. It's not our nature to destroy, you know, that's a lie. 
that's a narrative that's been projected back onto a, a false Paleolithic past. Um, you know, I'd like to dispel a couple of those myths for you and, um, you know, have a look at a, a little bit of uh, indigenous knowledge uh, in indigenous lens on things. But when I say indigenous, um, you know, I really mean human with, you know, what we're all supposed to be. You know, uh, you know, indigenous knowledge is just human knowledge. We all, we're all born with that. You know, we're all born as these indigenous people and then we're all gradually domesticated. And there aren't very many people on the planet, you know, including myself who aren't, you know, struggling with those different states of domestication from day to day. So, yeah. So I'd like to let you off the hook and not call it the Anthropocene. It's just a handful of assholes basically doing it. So they're probably better off calling it the, the asshole scene, a bit like the Holocene, but the asshole scene instead. Um, yeah. I don't think, uh, I don't, th I think we can let ourselves off the hook there and start to try and tap into a, a, a bit more of, you know, a connected related genius. Um, so how different are we all really? Um, you know, indigenous people of Australia, boomerangs, right? And what do boomerangs look like? You know, they're an angular throwing stick and they all come back. Um, well, that's not necessarily true. We have a lot of different diversity of boomerangs. And also the oldest boomerangs in the world, you know, have not been found in Australia. Um, I think the oldest one was found in Poland and it was made out of mammoth ivory. Everybody's made boomerangs, you know. Um, yeah, I, and I think, you know, when I show you this story soon, you'll see that, that we have uh, common origin stories. We have constellations in the night sky that, um, that human beings name the same way all around the planet, no matter what culture you come from. So that indicates that we all do have a common origin and we have a common story. And, um, you know, it's probably time for us all to recall that, to remember that and reconnect around it instead of these false narratives of a brutal, brutish, primitive past um, that's kind of been dropped like scales over our eyes. So what do boomerangs look like? Um, apologies for my screaming kids, by the way. Um, you're going to get that. Um, how about this one here? <laughs> Does that look like a boomerang? So that's a, uh, that's a fishing boomerang. You might hear that referred to um, in the book. Um, yeah. So that's a boomerang that's, that's used for stunning or knocking out or killing fish in the water. Um, you know, you, it's just designed to zip straight into the water and, and kill that. Um, highly adaptive, very diverse, you know, human cultures um, have always been. And they produce um, you know, really interesting innovations like this. Um, and the innovations don't stop. They don't freeze in time at some Paleolithic past that's supposed to exist in a state of unchange. Because that's what state means. You know, a state is like a stasis. It's a closed system that's frozen in time and place, um, you know, that has these false boundaries imposed around it um, in order that it can become entropic and break down and produce this linear view of time. Well, that's just uh, not true. You know, living cultures continue and they, they cycle around and feed back into themselves and, and, and uh, continue in that way forever. I'll show you some models of that soon. Um, so now those fishing boomerangs look a bit more like this. It's a very different material. <laughs> and it's pretty deadly, actually. Uh, it's literally deadly. Um, this beautiful steel thing, you know, as soon as um, roofing iron was introduced um, into the colony, <laughs> um, yeah, we started putting it to all kinds of uses, including making uh, boomerangs that were, um, were literally deadly. Um, yeah, really good. Um, so, you know, our cultures are adaptive in this way. Um, they always have been. But what is the nature of that adaptivity? Because it's something we're going to need coming into this Anthropocene. 
we need and um, people are calling for a new way of being as if this is something that we can design and that will emerge and that we can then freeze that system in place again and try and keep as much as <laughs> of much of this as possible um but what we're really looking at is um having to develop to co-evolve uh cultures of transition during a period of transition that is going to last for quite a while centuries you know so our cultures our emergent cultures um if we're actually being adaptive um and and becoming human in that way uh becoming a custodial species again um yeah the the emergent cultures for a few centuries are going to have to be cultures of transition that are transitioning us from one era to the next because the world that's coming out of this anthropocene is not going to look very much like the world that went in um that doesn't mean it's not going to be amazing and lovely by the way i'm sure we'll get it to that point um so i'm just going to share these images with you uh, as i said you know there are things that we share uh, this is one of the things that we share this is one of the oldest symbols known to humankind it is carved and painted on rocks and surfaces all around the planet it's ancient and almost everybody does it and paleontologists say if only we could go back in time and find out what it means well you could ask some of the people who are still painting this you know, some of the living cultures that are still drawing this in the sand like this because what this symbol is is the center the main focal point of any truly sustainable society truly sustainable culture it's the main focus that everything feeds into and feeds out of and if you're looking after this one everything else is taken care of this is the main thing that you have to do that you have to respect that you have to nurture that you have to protect support grow and what this is is a symbol of mother and child so mother is the circle and the child is the dot i'm sure as soon as i said that you thought oh of course it is on some level we all know this we all know this we all know this because of this way of thinking you know we're um we're related but our first way of being related is in pairs and the first pair that we ever belong to the first kinship pair is this mother and child and all other relationships come out from that one but we form many of these relationships you know um and it's not just with humans that's a very important thing we need to understand that we're also paired with non-human uh sentient beings plant animal beings uh even phenomena like um whirlwind cyclones uh everything from the macro to the micro even tiny little viruses are our relations and we're connected to these things and we have pairs and relationships with these things um when we come together in a pair um we share our stories stories are fine stories are really good they're a, a, the most perfect device for memory if you want to remember something make up a story about it it'll stay it'll go straight to long term memory but stories when they become yarns there's something that's shared stories come alongside each other and new things are learnt uh in between because the truth all knowledge is an aggregate of different points of view there is no one singular empirical truth or point of view all truth all knowledge is best in the aggregate and that's a very different thing from consensus um uh, so you can start to see out of here different decentralized sort of governance systems emerging um but when they emerge properly you won't need to call them decentralized anymore because the notion of centralized will no longer be a concept in your language so you won't have to call them decentralized you won't have to define things anymore by what they're not nonlinear postmodern all these things you won't need to define things by saying what they're not you'll be able to say what they are or if they just are 
Maybe you won't have to call them anything. Wouldn't that be nice, a world without abstract nouns? I know that world because there's no abstract nouns in my language. Um, it's a really, it's a good way to be in the world. Uh, speaking of the world, there are two worlds. There's Earth Camp and Sky Camp. And these two separated in the creation event of the turnaround. Uh, some people call dream time or dreaming. Chukurpaul, different things, different uh, translations and mistranslations of the same thing. But there was a big turnaround where Sky Camp and the Earth Camp separated. But there are lines of communication and exchange of energy, matter, and knowledge between those two. Um, now, the language of spirit moving across between these two worlds, the language of spirit is metaphor. Um, this is something, it's a way of thinking that I loosely term dreaming mind. It's where you use and manipulate metaphors uh, here in the tangible world. You change knowledge and things in the real world into metaphors, into the language of spirit, spirit and you move it across into this abstract space over here, this space of spirit, whether that's in cyberspace or in your imagination or on a piece of paper through diagrams and images or drawn on the ground. You know, this is the language of spirit and you manipulate things over there, move things around in order to find solutions in order to make patterns that you can then translate back through metaphors into the tangible reality right here. Um, this is the purpose of ceremony. This is the purpose of ritual. This is the purpose of culture. This is the purpose of language. Now cultures of transition need to do all these things through this related way of being where everything in creation only exists in relation to something else. Where all those complex relations form narratives that can be exchanged to form an aggregate truth that we can all share that we can use to create complex solutions in abstract theories and spaces and spirit and cultures to feed back into the world that has a lot of complex problems that need solving. <sighs> There's a, um, a state that you need to exist in, in order to do this. The, you can't do it all with your conscious mind. Uh, you need to tap into something a lot vaster. For a start, you need to um, be in that relation uh, to other people. If you're doing that connecting and you're sharing those stories and sharing in that way, you're creating a big collective mind in a group of people who are working together, sharing their knowledge, sharing their culture, building solutions together. Um, you know, that, uh, that takes a very different mindset from the one we're all currently in, uh, from one that I'm in right now and struggling to explain these concepts to you while I'm talking to myself into a screen. I have no idea what your reactions are. You might be rolling your eyes or um, walking around the room naked. I don't know. So I'm just uh, winging it. I don't even know if you're still there. Who knows? <laughs> but anyway, um, there is a mental state that you can get in. Maybe I can do this on my own, uh, talking to myself. But I think of it as ancestor mind. And I do it, I show it with this symbol. Um, this ancestor mind is kind of like, well, that's a Kulamon shape there or a shield shape. When you make these kinds of objects, you know, it's a very um, deeply meditative process. You know, you're very much connecting with the place you know, where you've cut that wood from. Um, you're connecting with the knowledge that you're putting into the object. So as you're carving it, you're putting knowledge and story into that object. And you're thinking of the relation, your relation with the person that you're going to give this to or share it with or um, use it to procure things that you're going to share with them. All these things come into relation. You're thinking of other kinship pairs like the uh, the, the older person who taught you how to make that thing, you know, all of these relational obligations are coming in um, and you 
finish up, uh, you might be there and suddenly you realize that it's dark and you can't see the thing in front of you and you're really hungry and you really need to go to the toilet and you realize that you've just lost six hours. There's some kind of uh, alpha wave state, a, um, a state of mind that you get in that just gives you boundless, limitless energy and um, extends your mind beyond your brain out to your body, to your hands, to the tools that you hold, to the objects around you, to the place you're in, to the places you're connected to, uh, to your ancestors. And you tap into and go inwards too. You're tapping into cellular memory, cellular knowledge. Um, things like that. And when you're in that state, then you can do this one. You start to be able to see bigger holistic patterns. So if you think of each of those lines that you see there, that's just basically this one. All those pairs come together. Big system. There's no separation of nature here. So maybe this is a storm bird. Uh, from up north in the Gulf Country and Cape York. And that storm bird, I call it Tuwo. The storm bird comes in that season, you know, when the wet season is starting, when all that, uh, that fresh water is running down the rivers and into the, the, the ocean along the coast so that it mixes with the salt water and becomes brackish water. And that seasonal signal is what brings that storm bird in it's called a storm bird because it comes with the lightning it comes with the storm and then it sits so it's called in by the storm and it sits and it calls out Whoa! it makes that sound and when it makes that call that calls in the freshwater sharks from up the river and they come down and they go along the coast and that's the time when you hunt those so you see those things are existing in relation that's a pair that storm bird and that freshwater shark but that's also paired with that uh, lightning in that uh, season, that torpak, and moving on into that, that wet time. So you see these pairs, they start to connect, but these are not just ecological systems because until the Greeks invented the word nature, there was no separation between nature and society. So this was our social system as well. So a woman might have that storm bird as a totem, that meant that she also had that freshwater shark as her totem. So you can see how these things start to connect. And so these complex patterns within ecosystems and within nature, they also determine your kinship systems, your totemic systems, which shape your governance systems, who speaks for what and when. There's a kind of dynamic subordination um, whereby the person who knows the knowledge for any given context, that that decision-making capacity might shift to them and they'll hear everyone's stories and then get that aggregate truth together and go, no, we're going this way. And then as they go along a little further and the context changes, then that decision-making capacity might shift to somebody else. Um, so what you have is, you know, it's not exactly a hierarchy, but there is a kind of distributed authority where everybody owns a piece of the knowledge and is responsible for different places, different things. And there's a kind of a, um, a distributed cognition, but a distributed distribution of power, a distribution of agency uh, that happens in the same way that you have in a natural system. And of course that spreads out into this. So that very simple pattern that we might start off there with a few lines. If you're doodling that on your page now, you might continue that pattern out and see that it makes amazing patterns. You'll see things in this chaos and see that there isn't, it's not chaos. It's not, it's actually complexity. And there are basins of attraction, strange attractors, basins of attraction where you can see energy moving through the system and being attracted to a certain point. You might see disruptions in the pattern, but then the way the overall system deals with that disruption and brings it back to a, um, you know, brings that hysteresis back to a, a state of homeostasis. There's that word state again. States of change, I think, is a delightful oxymoron. Um, 
they kind of mean opposite things. Um, so you start to see this permeating every relationship. So what of men and women? Uh, what of partners married? Well, you see that mother there and that child. So is this here? Well, that's her partner. And it kind of looks like he might be able to have some kind of domination or power imbalance there, the way he's sitting with her. The only thing is though, that she has three generations of women around her that hold him. <laughs> they hold, that's a check and a balance because they're his in-laws, his female in-laws. He's not even allowed to speak to them, but they hold power of life and death over him. You know, so you've got her cousins and sisters, her mothers and aunties and her grandmothers all here. Where's the great grandmother? I hear you ask. Well, that one cycles back to the center and becomes the child. So in our culture, you call your great grandparents, your sons and daughters or your nephews and nieces, because that comes back around again. It's kind of a beautiful thing that ensures a bit of intergenerational equity. Um, you will probably be more inclined to look after your place if you know that your great grandchildren are people that you're going to have to answer to as your uncles and aunties. <laughs> Not many people know that. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very beautiful cyclic thing and it's a good thing to belong to because you know that you're going to come around too in that cycle and that everything in the end goes back to the center, back to the child. Um, you reborn that one part of your spirit is constantly reborn back through. And you can see those beautiful three generations around there. So that's that first cycle of time. That's that creation time and that's eternal. Then that next cycle of time comes out from that. This is the second great age of creation. And then the third great age. Sorry about the blue. This is uh, my kid's sand pit. You know, the one you buy from Bunnings for 15 bucks. Yeah. Um, but you look at that one. That's not just a two dimensional image. Um, it's like you see it. If you look long enough at that and you draw it on the ground, you can see it coming up at you in 3d three dimensions. And it's a swirling uh, energy system. It looks a bit like that Taurus. It's like a big apple. If you let it lift up, you can see it a big sphere where everything is cycling round and round and it goes back to the center and then comes out from that center again and cycles around again. That is a stable system. That is a sustainable system. A system that's operating with those energetics, with those laws. And that's our law. Any system operating with that is a system that will um, enjoy renewal, endless, limitless cycles of renewal, particularly when it's, um, it's exchanging energy and knowledge and information with other systems. That's important. As soon as you close something off, you get entropy and you get that arrow of time. The trick that's been used for the last 12, 13,000 years or so, and I think it started with the Sumerians was writing. So the people in power, they invented this writing so they could then tell their own story about the past. Because if you can make up your own fiction about the past and set it down in writing in a permanent state, then you can create a state, a city state, and you can control the present. You can control the present and you can keep records, records of all transactions. And you can therefore control those transactions. And you can therefore make sure those transactions aren't distributed evenly throughout a complex dynamic system, but get directed into static heaps uh, for a privileged few. The worst thing is though, you can also control the future. And I guess you can see three parts of time there, past, present, and future. You control the future through written law with contracts. Contracts are legal things where you lock somebody and hold them to a future desired outcome. Um, but in our way, past, present and future are one thing. It's a different view of time. 
time itself is viewed differently. So in our Aboriginal languages, there's no separate word for time and place. Time and place are one thing. Time and place are the same concept. I hope that's not hurting your head too much. This will hurt your head. <laughs> so this is a compass or a map. And you can see that old story of the first man and the first woman um, in creation. And they came and they met here at the center, of course. And at the center of every country, of every bioregion, you'll find a place where that drama is played out. Uh, they didn't just go that way, though. They went out that way. And they traveled north, north, south, east, and west. Um, this shape here is the man's canoe. And here's the shape of him turning the canoe. Because that canoe does turn. North is not a fixed point. North changes uh, with the seasons. So <laughs> directions change. It's not a fixed magnetic north. It depends on where the sun is. So traditionally, <laughs> the compass was, um, you know, something that depended intensely on context. I guess Western ways of seeing the world, they remove context. They create these fixed states, static ideas like magnetic north, you know, uh, that can be generalized. It's very important in civilizations that depend on eternal limitless growth for their survival. It's very important to be able to make things scalable and to make things predictable. So therefore these kind of fixed laws are created. The only problem is the systems we live in are not fixed. They're complex, dynamic, constantly moving. And as our old people say in Australia, if you don't move with the land, the land will move you. <laughs> as you can see in all these symbols starting to come out here, you'll always see these seven points. That's those seven spirit families. No matter where you are in the world, you're probably familiar with that constellation of the Pleiades, which is also known the world over as the Seven Sisters. We all have that same name for that. The same name, it pops up all around the world. How did that happen? Well, it's because we have a common origin. Uh, the story of Orion, which is shown here. I know that doesn't look like the same shape, but this is the shape of the story. You know, it's a man's shape, the diamond. Uh, that is split by an impact. There's always an impact, a big bang at the start of creation. And you can see those seven spirit families emerging there. There's tension and balance between that man, that hunter and the seven sisters. And he is known as a hunter and a warrior, Orion, all around the world. And he's usually in some kind of weird drama with those seven sisters chasing them around the sky. There he is, that point of impact divides a man against himself. He spends his entire life and all of history trying to reunite himself. But a woman, she's divided also. And from that comes this sunrise and sunset dreaming. The sunrise, sunset dreaming is very important. Big law, big dreaming. And as you can see, you've got those seven spirit families emerging at those points there, the point of impact. And then all those points of differentiation. There's also a point of impact here with turtle story, the creation where the echidna uh, hit that. Echidna's a narcissist, of course, <laughs> in this, hits the turtle in the middle there, and that splits in the pattern of creation, which is one, one that becomes two, that becomes three, that becomes five. And then in those eight gaps in between those five, the four on each side, well, then there's eight, and of course, 13, and that continues on. You might be familiar with that as the Fibonacci sequence, supposed to be invented about 800 years ago, but it's a little bit older than that um, because it's in all these sand talk stories and these dreaming stories, uh, that pattern of creation. And when those circles come together in that pattern, you see this hexagon emerge. And that hexagon is one of the big uh, forms that emerges in nature everywhere around the world and everywhere in the universe. You'll see it in a sugar bag, hive, honeybee. That hexagon comes out. Oh, crap. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
So I'm going to stop sharing that now. Um, and yeah, I, I only have a few minutes left. What's important to know about complex adaptive systems? Um, I might have a look at the, um, the four principles or the four qualities of an agent, a node in a, um, a complex adaptive system, um, a system of agents or nodes, hmm. many, many different nodes. And that could be people, other sentient entities, everything that you can imagine in a system. Um, all those things have agency and have to exchange energy uh, information all the time. Um, in our way, we don't have a growth based system. Um, the indigenous way is an increase system. And there's a difference between growth and increase. So we have increased ceremonies that increase the fertility and the relationships uh, within a social system and an ecosystem that are not separate. Um, if you think of it like your brain, you know, you have several trillion, you know, potential neural connections there and you're only using a small fraction of that. You do not need to increase the size of your brain. You don't need to grow the size of your brain to be smarter. All you have to do is increase the relationships, the points of connection between those neurons. So an increase system is about increasing the relation, the relations and the connections, stimulating those in a system. Um, let's say you have those three things of that storm bird, freshwater shark, and that lightning. If you've got just one small part of a system that has maybe a thousand little nodes in it like that, uh, there are a billion different combinatorials of three within that just thousand little nodes. So if you imagine how vast, you know, a system, a local bioregion and the culture that develops in that, you imagine all of the nodes there potentially interacting, um, increasing in relatedness all the time. Um, that's what creation is. That's what increase is. Growth is different. Growth is about closing off a system and trying to grow the size of it. It's the difference between, um, you know, uh, printing more money to double the size of the economy or, or increasing your GDP to make your economy larger. That's growth based, but trying to increase the velocity of your dollar is a different thing. The amount of times a dollar is exchanged. That's truly the indication of a healthy economy. And it's the velocity of dollar that's stalled right now in the situation that we're in. And um, that's going to cause a lot of problems down the track in this uh, at least 10 years of global depression uh, that we're about to face. Um, in your local systems, you might look at increasing the velocity of items of value, markers of value. And in the end, markers of value are just markers of trust especially if you start to take more of a, um, an increase paradigm approach rather than a growth based approach. And these are things that we can do together in our communities, just like this states of change, these cultures of transition, we can create these now. And so we have those four behaviors. If you're a node, an agent, I like to say agent because each node in a complex system has agency. It moves and it interacts. So <clears throat> you need to behave as an agent in a complex adaptive system behaves. And, um, you know, like all the best AIs or anything, they operate under just three or four very simple operating protocols. Um, those protocols, are, first of all, connection. So, you know, yourself as an agent, you need to connect with as many other agents as you can. And you start with those pairs, those pairs. So you form as many little pairs as you can, and then you connect up those pairs, those little us twos. You connect them until you end up with these nice exclusive groups, you know, maybe all one gender or one language or one interest group. And that's nice, but if you keep it at that, it will stagnate. So you have to make sure that that group is interacting with other groups. So you make your exclusive group the us only. So you've got us twos in there and us only, you need to make them connect up with other groups. 
Uh, they need to network with all the other groups in that system. And you need exchange between those groups and across from agents in that group, because that's the next principle is diversity. And diversity is not a nice inclusion thing. It's not about having different colored faces sitting around your boardroom table. Um, diversity is a very different thing. Um, the diversity principle demands that you uh, make certain that you're distinct uh, from the other agents around you that are most similar to you. Um, and also that you need to connect with as many different agents who are completely dissimilar from you as possible. Uh, so we're nearly done. That, that's those two. So you've got that, um, that connection and that diversity and you need that interaction. You know, there needs to be interaction, which means exchanging knowledge, enemy, uh, energy, resources with friends and enemies right across the entire system. You need to be doing that. And if you're allowing that energy to move through you and every interaction that you have and every relation you have in that system, then you're allowing yourself to adapt. And that's the last principle. So there are four of them and you must adapt. Uh, you must allow that energy and the patterns within the system um, to change you. You have to allow them to change you to uh, co-evolve you into something that is the perfect agent for that system and for that time and place um, and moving forward into new eras, new times and places. Um, and that's, that's how that works. Uh, we didn't get to the respect, connect, reflect, direct bit, but <laughs> I think we're out of time. So we might come back to that after. What do you think, Brenton? Um, is that enough yep. monologuing? That was great. Sorry, I realized I should have left my video on so you had someone to talk to, but um, <laughs> that uh, would have been if, great. If, sorry about that. But um, <laughs> I was listening very, very intently. And um, that was that was beautiful. And, um, and I'm sure that um, everyone else who was listening to that um, was probably deep in thought, um, as as I was. Um, having just read the book, um, it was nice to sort of hear you talk to um, talk to some of the, the sort of um, the images that, that you write about as well. So no, thank you very much for that. Um, that was great. And, and I, I think we might come to some of those other points um, in, in the discussion. But what I'd like to do now is, is to bring uh, Angie into the conversation. Uh, so Angie Tangmari was born in Papakura and raised in South Auckland with a whaka papa uh, to Ngati Poru on her father's side and a pākahe from Taranaki on her mother's side. Uh, she combines her experience with government agencies, community and Fano to develop and co-design Fano-led programs, disrupting ineffective business as usual systems at the Southern Initiative. And so Angie is going to, you, the floor is yours, Angie, to uh, both tell us about how you've been uh, integrating uh, Māori perspectives into your work, as well as anything that, uh, that Tyson has uh, Tickled your, tickled your fancy in that, that, that presentation. So over to you. Ko kia ora tātou katoa, he mahine nui ki a koutou. Uh, ngā, ngā tangata whenua o te motu o te ao. Um, nō reira he mahi aroha, he mahi tautoko ki a tātou, ki a kaha tātou i tēnei wā. Uh, greetings from Aotearoa, New Zealand, to, um, to those that are joining us and all the people of the land around the world. I want to acknowledge the um, traditional custodians of throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. And I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And just before uh, I go into it, um, my, my um, sharing se session, sorry, I'd like to also acknowledge what's happening in uh, Minneapolis and Minnesota at the moment and send our aroha um, to the communities and the families there and uh, really hope people can stay safe um, and say that we hear their voices. Thank you so much for the introduction. Well, Tyson's a hard, uh, hard act to follow. That was a very deep hearing of ancient knowledge and I'm very grateful for that. Um, the good thing is it, it seems Tyson and I can agree on the most popular hairstyle of the time. So that's, all, that's good, We've got, um, that's a good start. Um, well, my sharing session is a little different. Um, I wanted to share with you an example of how we're triangulating Indigenous knowledge with other knowledge systems here in, in Aotearoa. So um, Brenton has just given you some context, but I work for 
um, the, social, uh, the Southern Initiative, which is a place-based initiative focused on um, supporting our families in South Auckland um, to create better outcomes. Um, and so we are the social innovation unit of, and we work alongside the co-design lab and the amazing Dr. Penny Hagen. And our job is to think about what do we need to do differently to get different results for our whanau. So if we think about, um, I'm born and bred South Auckland, this is my community. We're the large, Auckland is the largest city in um, Aotearoa in New Zealand and uh, has the, the, the most con concentrated uh, deprivation. And so our job is to think about how do we challenge the status quo for better outcomes for our, for our people. Um, and that is often um, challenging existing systems and responses. Part of us thinking about what needs to change has been an intentional uh, approach to triangulate Indigenous knowledge, design methodology and science to understand how those, those systems of knowledge can support innovation. Um, and so um, we know, as for many communities ar around the world, that the current system as it stands, despite uh, many programs, central government investment. Sorry, I should have said the Southern Initiative is a social innovation unit of the local, uh, uh, of local government, so Auckland Council. Um, so we know that, we look at the big data, we know that um, if we keep going as we are, uh, not, uh, we're not even holding state, we're not even holding a, a, a line. Things are getting worse for our whanau and that was prior to lockdown. It was prior to COVID-19. So we know we have to do things, we have to radically rethink or reimagine or radically challenge existing processes, programs, thinking uh, to support uh, equitable outcomes for our, for our, for our communities. Um, so as I said, this, this, what we've been thinking about is how we fold in Indigenous knowledge with other systems. And the way that we do that is to uh, support a, um, to support our practice, our conceptual thinking and our practice with a cultural framework. That framework helps us to understand a way of being that's grounded in Indigenous knowledge. So as um, Tyson was saying, a way of being with each other, a way of being with the environment, a way of being in, with these complicated and complex systems that we're working with. Um, and what's, the, the synergies are here in the, 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 sh the sharing um, that Tyson's, uh, the sharing of knowledge that Tyson's just um, privileged us with is, um, what's criti critical in the way we think about Indigenous knowledge when we're thinking about systems change for equal, equitable outcome. Um, and the way that we're thinking about innovation methodology for equitable outcome for our, for our communities, for those mo most marginalised, which in South Auckland is our Indigenous population, our Pacifica population, our refugee and migrant population. Um, there's some key components, some ways of being that we are now integrating in to the way we interact with system and how we ask system to respond for our communities and our families. And some of those are similar to uh, the components of knowledge that um, Tyson's just touched on. One of those is relationships and the connections of kinship and how incredibly important those are for people to be well um, and how incredibly important they are for us to adapt as a system so not just recognising they're important for our families and community, but they're also important inside of the system. Um, to recognise the, the importance of, um, Tyson touched on, um, yarning. To recognise the power of what we would call whānau kōrero. Um, that's the, the power in families and communities being able to tell those their own stories and the entirety of their stories. Um, and having those stories recognised as having the same legitimacy, the same validation, the same power, the same value as traditional data sets or traditional uh, knowledge systems as well. So um, we, we use the, this uh, 
this this cultural framework to help us to know how to how to be in the system how to be with each other and how to challenge the system in terms of the ways that they are uh, responding that are not conducive to equitable outcomes and what we're learning is that we we think as part of an innovation methodology that seeks system change and innovation at a community level we're thinking that this uh, our uh, Indigenous knowledge helps us to navigate the complexities of um, our systems here and provides an alternative to what can be at times a bi many binary process processes inside of a complex system. I can touch on um, an example of that. So when we think about the complexity of system, uh, we think that Indigenous knowledge can help us not just navigate that, but to provide provide alternatives to existing status quo system. And so um, I, I'd like to talk about uh, a piece of work that we're doing now that we were supporting during uh, lockdown um, to give you an example about how that works at a local level in, in terms of systems change. Um, and so I was uh, fortunate enough to be able to support a, a, a multi-agency response to family harm here in my own community and that response was initiated at the start of lockdown. There were multiple systems uh, predictions about the effect of, um, effect of uh, lockdown for our people in my community and there was an immediate system response to stand up a crisis intervention process triage for our communities. And I was part of the initiation of that. And what we've what we've tried to learn in supporting that crisis intervention process is how do we, with a, with a culturally grounded innovation methodology, firstly, indigenize the traditional system response. So how do we influence the system response as required? And at the same time, how do we enable, catalyze, support family and community-led cultural responses uh, for alternative uh, systems of support for our community and our, and our family? So that's what we were supporting in terms of the Family Harm Initiative here in, in my community. And what we've learned from that process is uh, Inevitably, the system will try to validate its own prediction and its own response. And there, was a, there is a need for a crisis intervention response. And what we know is that we also need to hold what whānau or families require in terms of support and how we support future aspiration in a strength-based way. And so uh, at, the result of us supporting the system response was to to propose alongside the systems intervention crisis triage process, which is can be uh, binary, you are referred to an agency or not, depending on the level of risk for your family. Um, but that really is the pathway. You either get referred or you don't. Uh, what we were able to propose is that there is an alternative healing process that is grounded in cultural knowledge where families have the opportunity to address uh, intergenerational or significant past trauma uh, instead of the um, oh, sorry i shouldn't say instead, as well as the immediate uh, need that they are identifying for themselves so that was an example of how we were using indigenous knowledge to begin to propose alternative solutions for outcomes inside of the, uh, tr the traditional system. The second part of our work sits alongside that system response and that is how might we enable and empower our local communities and families to create and test their own local fit for purpose solutions for themselves. And one of the uh, uh, insights for us in this uh, lockdown period was that the power of 
social capital, of connections, we call whanaungatanga, kinship, um, of collective altruism um, to support better outcomes for our families, for people to help each other, for families to help each other, for us to help each other as human beings. There's so much potential in that for us to lean into that and resource that appropriately and enable that appropriately alongside system responses. So we were doing, so we were supporting indigenizing the system response, um, innovating inside of the system, and we are attempting to enable our people to be autonomous, to not rely on system responses at the same time. Um, and so it's, 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 it's complex work, um, it's dynamic work. Um, and we are challenging some fairly embedded uh, mindsets and attitudes towards our communities and towards our families and towards race um, and it, towards class. Um, and so at times uh, it, is, it, is, it is hard going, but what we think uh, from this learning and lockdown is that we need to be in both places for innovation at a localised level. Of course, there's a requirement to advocate at a policy level um, as well. But for us um, here in South Auckland, uh, in Aotearoa, we're trying to do, we're trying to understand what it looks like to catalyze innovation res responses that are fam community and whanau led, family led and cu culturally grounded. Um, just some things about uh, some observations of system response and insight and learning in terms of the lockdown and COVID-19 here. And that is, my experience with the multi-agency response is that there was an unprecedented, unprecedented ability to unlock resource and support for families that they did not have prior to lockdown. And you could make, uh, you could make some obs observations or you could make some comments about why you think that is. Um, the reality is that for some of our people here in South Auckland who are waiting to be housed, waiting two years to be housed, they were housed in two hours. For some people who were lining up, waiting to access uh, food grants or um, uh, to access other financial support, sometimes they'd wait for five hours in a line and wait two days. That happened in two hours. So um, our observation is the, the potential to respond in, an, in a generous abundance mindset for our communities and our, and our families, uh, the potential was always there. What we're trying to understand now is what were the conditions that enabled that unlocking of resource? Often it was the ability to bypass criteria or eligibility. And often it was not. So the question is, in the time of lockdown, when we were able to provide our families, some of our families, more support and more resource in the time of lockdown than prior to lockdown, what were the conditions that enabled it that we need to understand that pretty quickly so that we can continue to enable that post lockdown. We want our system to continue to respond to families in a way that is generous, um, that is respectful, um, and that we continue to have an abundance mindset around um, how we support our families as opposed to scarcity and uh, criteria or eligibility focus. So we're leaning in really quickly to understand that systems response and we're trying to create um, a space to reflect those insights back to system so that we can continue to enable those. The other, the other part is that our, our communities um, are resilient. Um, most of our colonised people have been in crisis since colonisation. So lockdown for some of our families was an everyday, was an everyday um, experience. They always had issues around accessing food. They never had enough money. They always had issues around housing conditions. Um, they're incredibly resilient and they're incredibly generous. Um, and how do we continue to catalyse those and support that as part 
of an ecology of support for our community. So recognise the value of that, the value of kinship of whanaungatanga, the value of uh, collective altruism, the value of what we would call manaakitanga, caring for others, nurturing others, the value of mana, recognising the inherent sanctity of each, of, of all beings. Um, how do we continue to, to support that as a valid part of a support ecology at a local level for, for, uh, for, com for communities? Um, so that's, that's what we've learned from uh, our time, um, supporting assistance response and supporting a whānau uh, or a, a community, family and community-led approach to innovation that's culturally grounded. Um, Hmm. How much more time do I have, Brenton? I'll just double check with you. There we go. All right. Um, we've got about five minutes before we're going okay. to um, ask the, uh, the, the the audience um, to reflect. But I, I okay. would encourage you know, Tyson, if you wanted to jump in, I know he's momentarily um, busy, but if we wanted to open <laughs> it up a bit of a conversation between the two of you, that would be, that'd be fine as okay. well. We've about five minutes. Okay, maybe I'll just touch on what I thought was really, I uh, really uh, resonated with me at um, that, uh, some of the sharing that Tyson was um, providing was the the interesting um, growth and increase in growth conversation. And one of the things that we're thinking about is um, so sitting alongside our indigenous knowledge component of our innovation methodology, we're also um, triangulating that with design methodology and the, and neuroscience. One of the things that just struck a chord with me was Tyson was talking about increase. And there's something about that for us as well. And that is, we're really trying to understand how you increase bandwidth for people. You don't need to grow their brain, he's right, but you do need to grow the way that the, the neurons are connecting and the stress that people are living under. So it's often, uh, uh, sorry, um, it's often not about uh, growth, but increasing uh, ways, of thinking about ways of increasing bandwidth capaci capacity capability that's existing. Um, and we, we are thinking about that um, in terms of uh, families and adults and children in the families and how we support that. And I'm really drawn to that concept because for those that have experienced intergenerational poverty, colonization, marginalization, um, bandwidth and capacity to deal with the stress and capability to deal with the stress um, is, is a critical factor in people being able to navigate system and be well. So I'd really, um, I'd really like to talk to Tyson about that more at some, some stage. Mute. I can't. Hey, I'm unmuted. Beautiful. Um, uh, look, you know, Maori uh, streets ahead of everyone else, you know, because you've, you've spent decades and done the hard yards. You made the mistakes back in the day, you know, um, you know, sending people all off to boarding schools and university. That was decades ago. You realized that was a mistake because when they came back, they weren't Maori anymore. You know, um, we're still in that phase of like we're, we're that's where we're up to in Australia is sending our kids off to boarding school and university and um, you know a lot of us are trying to deal with that stuff and doing the decolonizing but then trying to do the grassroots organizing and taking care of those relationships but you know most of your talk you were talking about those relationships and building community making community strong first and you know that's that's the stuff that you need to take care of first before you do anything else and then, you know, you need to get into those, once you're strong enough, get into those decolonizing frameworks and take care of things. And it's, it's kind of like you need to do that before and have that all healthy before you can start applying the indigenous knowledge. And maybe that's what we all uh, take away for all of us, is that very much we need to decolonize as much as possible our thinking before we can take up um, this knowledge and start to do really interesting things with it. I freaking love hanging out with Maori techies, eh? You know, because they do all that grassroots stuff first and then they then they get into data sovereignty and sort that out and then they start innovating. So I met these Maori techies who are starting to look 
you know, they're, they're coding in Maori language instead of coding in English. And, you know, the exciting thing, I, I've met some uh, Lakota Indian coders as well, coding in their own language. And what's beautiful about that is our indigenous languages don't have the same if then propositions as in English. So what do we have instead in our coding and what kind of code does that make? You know, so you've got Maori um, coders and techies um, envisioning and innovating and designing Maori AIs, you know, that only respond to Maori language and that are running on code in Maori language. Um, just amazing stuff like that. But then, you know, with the grassroots thing and having a whole community, there's other, you know, beautiful, elegant solutions that seem simple, you know, like, um, oh my God, how are we going to earthquake proof our servers? Oh, you just float him on the creek there, bro. It's easy. <laughs> you know, so they make those rafts and they put the servers out on the creek floating on the water. Then when the earthquake comes, the only people left with internet is the Maori there. <laughs> um, yeah, just beautiful stuff going on there. So yeah, I just really appreciated hearing from you. Um, thanks both. Um, we do have more time, um, but we do want to give the, the, uh, the audience both a chance to sort of stop listening and just listen to themselves for a minute. Um, and then we're going to come back with, uh, with some of the Q&A that, that people have sent through. What I'm going to do is I'd like to leave people with a question. I'm going to bring it up on screen. Um, and I'm going to give people it's going to feel a little bit awkward for some people who don't like silence, but we're going to give you a couple of minutes just to uh, look at this question. Uh, so how might we use uh, some of the ideas that we've heard, you know, in this last hour and a bit to better share and receive our own knowledge. Um, both we, we're going to be spending the next three weeks together in a learning festival. So how can we start to think about building in some of these principles, but beyond that in our work and our practice, how might we do that? So I'm going to stop talking and we're going to enjoy some silence for about a minute or two. So hopefully that wasn't too uh, awkward for people. Um, but we, we find when we've been doing these talks recently that uh, it can be quite hard when you've got 10 hours of Zoom and all you're doing is processing and hearing information. We want to give people a bit of a chance to think. Um, so um, we are going to go to sort of the Q&A. Um, but maybe before we did, I just I, I want to give um, Tyson a bit of a chance to talk to some of the things that I know was in the book that I think would be really interesting for this audience. And one of the ones I was wondering if you could talk about briefly, Tyson, you mentioned um, a research paper you did um, on, um, in the sort of, in the Wit language about the different ways of coming to knowledge. 
the five different ways of coming to knowledge. And I was just wondering maybe if you could talk a, a little bit about, about that as the, dif the different ways that, um, I don't know if you remember that part of the book. <laughs> it's towards the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's four, like the process. Uh, yeah, the, the, the sort of the, 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 the learning through observation, the passing on knowledge, the, the passing of the yarning and then memorizing through deep listening and then thinking and reflecting to that one. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so that was the, those were the WIC, yeah. the WIC pedagogies really. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, you know, so you have um, um, Ma Aten, um, which is like helping hand. Um, and so that's something where you, you do things in parallel alongside. Um, you model things for each other and you observe each other and you learn like that, you know, um, in a kind of community of practice. Um, so you model things for each other and, and you kind of scaffold them. And, you know, you, you see the entire action completed first. And then you come in for, you know, different stages, you know, coming in in small parts first and gradually build up. That's that ma'atan. Um, me'atan is, that's, um, that's learning through observation. Um, you know, so that's watching, um, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, lots of demonstration. Um, very practical. Um, um, it's funny that there's, there's quite a few. But they're all, all those pedagogies are a body part, um, like me, I, you know, and ma, hand, um, attached to the word that means um, something like to spread in, in the way that a, a bushfire or a disease spreads. You know, you, you, they, it, it kind of spreads. So it has that idea of being something that spreads organically but through these different parts of your body, you know, uh, so con uh, art and, you know, is that listening, that really deep listening, um, but listening with more than your ears, you know, uh, the most important thing to know there is that, um, that listening is seen as the seat of intelligence in Aboriginal cultures. So um, all the words for thinking, listening, remembering, processing, um, analyzing all these words, they all um, have, uh, they're, they're all based on the words for ear or hearing, you know, and someone with a, a, a learning impairment um, is called went, which is also the word for deaf, you know, so the idea of, you know, listening, is, so is knowledge. But it's funny because a lot of listening is described as coming in through the the eyes as well. So that's a very observational thing too. Um, you know, ta'atan is learning through language, um, not just it, it, through verbal instruction. That's considered to be the lowest form of pedagogy, um, like training a dog or an animal. Kong <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's that idea of that, um, you know, that uh, learning through listening and deep, you know, like uh, memorizing memorizing understanding uh through that deep listening uh coming to that those stages um um yeah so there's as always there's there's five of them and you know that and we we'll always think of that thumb as being the one that that checks in you know that that one of more of spirit um that one that's um that's more, you know, I guess uh, I put a little bit in the comment there, how you, your framework, you know, for this festival, you've got that, that heart, head and hands, yeah. you know, and, um, and that's, that's funny because it's the same. <laughs> yeah. Same and I hadn't got to that, that we, part of the book yet we when we designed the festival. <laughs> yeah. So that's really exciting. Um, because I think that that's all your different layers of, you know, um, ontology and epistemology and methodology, you know, the work of your heart of building those relations and connecting. And then it's your also thinking together in that aggregate of bringing the stories together and, and building your knowledge, you know, uh, together and your theories of knowledge and your modeling and all that sort of thing. And then there's what you're going to do, the practical, 
the work of your hands and your feet. Um, but overall of that is your axiology. It's your, your values, your ethics. Um, and that's that other part, which is your gut, you know, your spirit. That's your you know, and big spirit that's uh, in your belly, you know. Um, and, and we all know, you know, even in modern medical science recognizes that as being separate from the rest of your central nervous system. It has its own nervous system and nobody quite knows how it works yet. Well, you know, <laughs> modern science doesn't know how it works yet. We do, um, yeah. you know, and that's your, you know, that's your higher thinking. That's your really, it's a, a completely different kind of cognition. So that's your big mind. That's your big spirit thinking and working through you. And you have to have that and you have to follow your gut and things, but you have so to connect we're, 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 that, that gut with a lot of other guts. <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll guts build the everywhere. gut stage. We'll build the gut yeah, yeah. stage. <laughs> yep. Excellent. Um, I've got a question from Rowan Conway who, who says um, that she wants to pause on the innovation connection and how to genuinely decolonize the future. So the question is, how do we approach innovation like ancestors? Mm. Well, uh, by making sure you don't ignore that first step of spirit, uh, starting with the gut, starting with the spirit. Um, which is so mum Doris Shillingsworth, she, she names those four stages as respect, connect, reflect, direct. And she notes very um, wisely, I think, that usually non-Aboriginal people will go the other way around. They'll start with direct, you know, they'll come in with the intervention, you know, the program or the project or the design that they want to implement. They'll direct that. And then it all falls down. And so then they go into reflection mode <laughs> and they, you know, they run their metrics and they, they analyze the data and they figure out what went wrong and realize out of that, that they probably should have formed relationships and done what Angie, <laughs> you know, uh, found out even in her speech, you know, before she spent the first three quarters of it, setting up those relationships and that groundedness, that grassroots business, you know, so you need to do that, that uh, connect. Um, yeah, so that's, so then I guess then they do that. Then they call all the elders together usually and have a barbecue <laughs> and invite community, come and have some free food. Um, and they basically form a few relationships and then they finally learn as they're leaving, as they're getting on the plane, they, 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 they get the last one respect and they're crying, getting on the plane and they're going, thank you. I've learned so much from you. You've taught me so much. Thank you for your wisdom. And we're like standing there going, yeah, but you wrecked the joint. <laughs> so yeah, that's how she sort of sees that, that you basically just got to reverse that process and start with re respect. You know, you, you start with respect every time. That's law. That's the law. So you come into the law of the land and, you know, you establish that respect. You bring your stories, you come alongside and you establish what your ethical framework of how you're going to be and what you're going to do that's actually serving the needs of the land and the community and that you coming into that system will be coming in in the right way as an agent of sustainability and connectivity and you know adaptivity and all the rest once you have that law that respect then you can move into um reflect you know which is the work of the head then you can move into, you know, uh, sorry, connect, sorry, the work of the heart. Then you can move into reflect the work of the head. And then you can move into direct, which is the work of the hands. Um, and I think if you follow that, you know, that really broad basic process, you, you got it. You get there by the time you come to direct, you'll be doing amazing innovations, even if it's just floating your server in a creek. <laughs> Angie, did you want to say something? I just wanted to support that that and say that uh, our practice similarly is uh, starting with creating uh, respectful, enduring relationships. So we don't engage with people because it's a project. We engage with people to create authentic relationships that are enduring beyond whatever we're going to be doing together because now we're connected um, and now we're kin or now we're whanaunga. And I think there's something really critical in that because I agree most systems or programmatic or intervention responses will not begin with the relationship. They'll begin with a problem or a deficit approach to what they're trying to 
solve. And so, you know, for many organisations, you, you, you're not encouraged to begin a relationship in the way that Tyson's just uh, described, but that's our practice, is to take the time to know who, who am I, who are, who are you, how are we connected, um, and how do we remain connected, and how do I continue to care for you, uh, regardless of what we're doing in terms of the work. And reciprocity in that relationship is critical, particularly for, for agencies. Um, to recognise our power and to, to know that those relationships need to be re re reciprocal um, and the, the, whatever people are bringing into that relationship, particularly knowledge, needs to be valued and, and acknowledged. Thanks, Angie. Uh, so I've got a question from Malaysia um, around, um, this is an international learning community, so um, they're working with the Orang Asli uh, communities to address environmental challenges and to create sustainable livelihoods. Their question is, what would be a good way of sharing lessons learned in a two-way flow between our countries? So Tyson, I'm not sure, if, have you got sustainability networks that you're, you're connecting up with that, that they can be part of? Um, I, I believe there was, uh, when I was working at Monash University, I believe there was, there was a lot going on with uh, Malaysia. I think they've got a a campus there and there was a lot of talk about uh, connecting um, with uh, indigenous knowledge there I'm not sure where that's gone with the new um, they have a new um, uh, vice chancellor indigenous there Jacinta Ralston uh, she's from Cape York so she must be deadly and um, yeah <laughs> so I you know I, I guess you can you can form those kind of uh, uh, linkages across but you know what I've, I've always I mean I, I <laughs> I, I haven't felt like to this date in my career, I've, I've been at it for a couple of decades. I haven't felt like um, I've sorted things out on the ground here enough yet to be able to go over. There's lots of exchanges. I, I don't know where they get the money from, but we're funded so much to travel overseas to like, you know, go and look at buffaloes and, and go sit down with Navajo and, and, you know, Inuit and, and and oh, they're always going to New Zealand. Lots of lots of that back and forth. You know, I keep seeing people being f flown across and accommodated there and flown back. I've seen it for decades now, and I just always wonder. And they always come back and say the same thing. You know, same things. Well, it, it's great, but we still haven't taken care of things here. Um, instead of spending all that money on flights and accommodation and food, I tell you what, in, to try and find other methods to close the gap. How about you just take all that money and put it in our bank accounts, you know, just of the families who had their wages stolen over the last generation. Uh, that would do, that would be a good gap or close like mad. You know, <laughs> if you put, you know, the $50,000 that it costs to fly half a dozen teachers and a, a couple of indigenous teacher aides to, to Alaska and New Zealand, if you took that and put that just in my niece's bank account, you would change the whole family forever and the gap would close. <laughs> and that's all it would take. Um, so yeah, for me, I've, I've never actually gone overseas and I've met lots of delegates coming here. And, you know, I, I've, I don't know, it's, it is good to meet them and it feels good and all the rest. But I think very much like Angie, I'd be more about, you know, taking care of what's happening with you locally first and having something good to share before you go somewhere else or before you invite anybody else in, uh, which the Murray do all the time. Like, you know, lots of us go into the Murray and we come back sort of wistfully <laughs> talking about all the amazing stuff they're doing over there and how far advanced they are with their methodologies and their innovations and everything else. Um, it gives us something to aim for, I guess but also kind of makes us feel a bit <laughs> narraga. <laughs> um, we've got another question from Helsinki um, and it's a uh, slightly different take on, on this, this question, which is about uh, what are the appropriate ways of using indigenous knowledge in research and practice in contexts where we don't have immediate access to indigenous communities. So what's an appropriate way of trying to, um, I guess, build on some of the principles that you've, you've set out? Go talk to some Same. <laughs> you 
you got indigenous people there just around the corner. Um, go and have a yarn with them. I've talked to Same and they're awesome. They're amazing. Um, so I guess you'd start there. Yeah. But you, you, and, you made but the, the other you thing in the book about indigenous not necessarily being black, white, but actually indigenous yeah. come in all different shapes and sizes. Exactly. And colors. Exactly. You know, and and you know, not very men of many of us are very exotic anymore. And you know, if we are, it's 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 probably just because you know it's good for business. You know, so uh, yeah, you don't have to expect to see us all standing on one leg. Um, you know, we're all basically laboring, um, struggling under the weight of this oppressive, horrendous system. And it's something that we all have in common together is that our ongoing assimilation and oppression and um, domestication and, and our, our gradual mutation into these feedlot, feedlot pigs that we're becoming as human beings. I say, get your feral on, you know, escape from the <laughs> feedlot, get out there, run around, grow your tusks out. Um, yeah, see what it is to be human, to be truly human. You know, you'll find that, you know, we're all under those same stars with the same story and that it was five minutes ago, you were out, you know, on the tundra hunting aurochs. That was five minutes ago. It's, it's not impossible to get that kind of thinking back. You just got to open up your mind to the land around you and um, make some observations. I think that feels like a beautiful, beautiful point to sort of pause and a and a great sort of challenge for us um, to get our to get our feral on um, as we become <laughs> human through this transition. So, look, um, I just want to say thank you very much, Tyson and Angie, for your contributions uh, to kick this festival off, and hopefully, in the right spirit. Um, I actually did want to share one last quote from your book, uh, Tyson, just because I think it it speaks to this being a learning festival. Um, and you said that if people are laughing, they are learning. True learning is a joy because it's an act of creation. Uh, so again, thank you for helping us uh, get this, this party started. Hopefully, even in these dark days, we can still find the space to laugh while we learn. Um, and uh, I hope people uh, watching uh, have, have taken as much out of this as I have. It's been brilliant. Yeah. So Thanks. thank you to both. Um, that's it for today. Um, join us uh, for the rest of the next three weeks. Um, this has just been a bit of a taster um, of what's to come. Um, over the next few days, we will have uh, Jeff Morgan uh, joining us uh, tomorrow, talking about how governments think and can think better, along with Aaron Manium uh, from the Singaporean government. Uh, on Wednesday, we're hearing from the Victorian Public Service, uh, head of the Victorian Public Service, on their innovation govern their governance innovations in a time of crisis. Um, and we're hearing from Cassie Robinson on Thursday about uh, how we um, respectfully decommission things that are no longer fit for purpose. So um, I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, recordings will be available soon, and we'll see you next time.